So our speaker today is Brian Kressel, who is currently a senior geochemist at Mercator Geological Services, which is a consulting group based in Nova Scotia, Canada. He holds an honors BSc as well as an MSc in geology from the University of Manitoba and is completing a PhD dissertation at Dalhousie University here in Halifax. His experience includes application of geochemistry and statistical methods to mineral exploration, analytical instrumentation, and project management on a variety of commodities across Canada, including gold, rare metals, rare earths, and diamonds. He is responsible for sophisticated data analyses and database development to support prospectivity and targeting strategies. Ryan is developing and refining unique geochemical and mineralogical fingerprinting signatures for specific deposit types, which brings us to his talk. Um, today, Ryan will focus on how Mercator is using principal component analysis as a mineral exploration technique to help clients extract overlooked information from their multi-element geochemical data. We are looking forward to hearing on how to effectively map and interpret PCA transform data sets. Ryan, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Okay, mm -hmm. good description. Thank you very much for that. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about um, how we are using some statistical methods, principally principal component analysis, to help our clients in gold exploration projects. So how we're using it as a gold exploration tool. So I'll just jump right into our presentation. Um, so the title, yeah, again, is using principal component analysis as a gold exploration tool. The next slide, I just have a, an outline for it. So I've kind of broken it into a few different parts. So I anticipate that the audience here is gonna have a variable experience or knowledge of what principal component analysis is. So I give a kind of more rudimentary, a very low level description of it. I'm not going into the math, I'm just gonna kind of describe what it is and qualitatively how it works. And then I'm gonna um, jump into how we're applying it at Mercator. So how we're specifically using it and then about how to use the results that we get from when we're using it. And then I'm gonna give them a case study. Um, and then I'll jump into a few more smaller examples and then give some final thoughts on it. And you'll see that I have a number of examples around here. The, prime, the bulk of it is actually example number three. But I do have some small examples just to kind of demonstrate some of the um, main um, things that I want to bring up during the talk, some main features of the method and how we're using it. So I'm just going to jump into right into an overview of what principal component analysis is. So it's a classical statistical method. It is nothing new. Um, so it's a it's a it's a linear like a linear algebra transformation that takes your data set and can be used to reduce the number of variables. So it takes your, what your existing data set is and creates it into principal components that represent your variability from the data set. So it lumps together correlated variables to make principal components. Um, it's developed a long time ago in the early days of the development of statistics um, directly from Carl Pearson. Um, so we're not taking any credit for this. It's been around and used in a number of fields. It was more formalized in about the 1930s. Um, I think mostly related to into going into psychology and used it quite a bit, but it's used in a broad range of scientific fields and now including geochemistry or in, geo in geology and we're using it for mineral exploration. I think a big advancement for us and why it's becoming more known or more used is just because it's more available than it once was. So hundred years ago, if you're using it in mineral exploration, it would be a lot of linear algebra calculations that you wouldn't want to be doing by hand. But now with these readily available statistical software such as MATLAB, R, and for us geochemists, it's easy to just click a button in IOGAS and get results really quickly. Um, so it's a lot more accessible by just writing a few lines of code because the algorithms are already there or clicking the button because it's built into the software. So, I'm seeing more and more of it being used myself, and it's nothing new, but it's finding new applications, I should say, and probably not just in our field, but in other fields as well. Um, just kind of a very qualitative description of how it actually works, the transformation. So the variables are average and they center on a mean value. So it starts off with an early transformation of the data just to kind of center it, normalize the data. Um, it creates a covariance or correlation matrix, depending on what kind of PCA you want. Not all PCAs are the same. I believe most of them that you'll see are usually just kind of fall into correlation um, principal component analyses. Um, and once they calculate that, they can use the covariance or correlation matrix to actually search for 
the greatest variability within that matrix. And that direction of variability within the data set becomes your first principal component. And so that describes your greatest, in our case, geochemical variability that exists within the data set. And it's just a statistical number that is descriptive in nature. Um, from there, it searches for the next greatest direction of variability that's orthogonal to that PC1. And that becomes defined as PC2. And it does that again for PC3. And then it does it again, so on and so on, until it actually hits an end value that's the same as your variable. So it defines a whole lot of principal components from that. You don't need to know them all or use them all. You usually end up dropping insignificant ones as you move along. But it, it's a descriptive way to, um, it's a descriptive statistical way to look at your data to see what trends are in there and what elements are correlated with each other. Um, just a very simple, um, graphical um, description of it here. So this is if you get a two variable um, data set, X and Y, and generally you're not gonna need to do a PCA because you can see the trends within the data, but just for to demonstrate how it actually works is, is that if your data sets here at X and Y are positively correlated, the PCA is gonna search for where PC1 should be, where it's along the greatest direction of variability. So it defines PC1 to kind of just run through the direction, which is kind of like your regression line in there. And then it's gonna look for the next greatest variability orthogonal to that, which is just that direction here. So we get some scatter going in that way. And so when this data set becomes described as PC1 and PC2, as opposed to X and Y, it would look more something like this. So you would still have the same distribution of data, but it would look more like that. It gets a little more complicated when you have higher variables and P, like PC3 and onwards, the data becomes a little more deformed or a little more differently oriented. But I think this demonstrates kind of what the actual transformation is doing to your data. Um, so as I was saying, the main strength of using principal component is that it's a data reduction method that combines your correlated variables. So if you know that certain elements are increasing and decreasing together, this method will kind of lump them together into the same principal component. And that you can just look for that principal component to describe all those elements together. So if you're making another, a number of spatial plots to look for pathfinder elements, instead of having like four or five plots, if you use a principal component, you might be able to describe it in one plot. So you can kind of find what you're looking for a lot quicker. Um, so application to geochemistry, this is not a new Mercator application. I think there's examples from probably, but went back to I think about the 1980s is the first I've kind of heard of stories of using PCA. Um, don't ask me them for them specifically because I, I can't pull them off hand, but I've talked to people and it sounds like it's been going on for a while. And I think the big breakthrough was the Atchison papers in the early 80s. Um, before that, PCA or classical statistics in general weren't really being applied or weren't supposed to be applied anyways to compositional data just because of a closure issue. And that's just because they're summing up to a unity. So 100% are summing up to one. And, to, and that causes a lot of um, spurious um, correlations or false correlations, you can say, within your data set. So to deal with that, actually then came up with some transformation, a log ratio transformation. And that kind of removed the closure problem, which opened this up a little bit more to people. And that's kind of when you start seeing the, the te technique being used. But I think there's a no more recent influx of it as well, just because of the availability of algorithms and software for statistics, along with it's a lot easier to spatially look at this data now with people using LeapFrog and other, or uh, just even two-dimensional uh, GIS software. So, easier to actually look at and analyze your data today than it was even in the 1980s or the 1990s. So it's, um, it's a growing field. And I think that it's a great application of statistics to get the most out of our geochemical data that we're collecting in exploration projects. And we can even go back and look at those earlier collected data from the 1980s or, or um, around that era to compile that data and reanalyze it using these more modern techniques, I guess you can say. Um, so just kind of a basis on how we interpret these data. It's just that the principal components in a way can be interpreted to represent different geological processes. So if there's a large variability with a data set, there's some kind of geological process. If it's just simply something like 
um, mineral concentrations as we're changing from one mythology to another, or if there's an alteration index on there, that we're kind of looking at these principal components as representing different processes that we may be looking for in an exploration project. Um, and the last point I just want to make on this slide is that there's a thing, and anyone who's familiar with IOGAS probably knows it, is this k-means cluster algorithm. Um, it's commonly, I find, used with the PCA method, and it's kind of like a standard way, and I've done it many, many times, is where you click the PCA, and then afterwards you're like, well, let's see what the cluster is going on that data, and then you add in the k-means cluster. Um, I do recognize there's other cluster algorithms as well, but this one seems to be in the forefront just because it's readily available probably in IOGAS and other softwares, but something they're definitely worth exploring. And there is, it's an easy way to kind of lump your data together so you can look for trends within it. So I just kind of mention it because it's a common practice. Um, and so when you hit a PCA, um, say in IOGAS or in you run it in R or any other type of software, you're gonna get a load of statistical numbers coming out at you. Um, and this is kind of just an example of some of the numbers. You also usually pretty, produce a number of graphs as well. Um, I'm just gonna focus on the numbers. I'm a numbers guy, I like looking at raw data and kind of looking for trends in it. So kind of decided to go this route for the presentation. Um, so the first one I'm gonna bring up is at the top of here is the eigenvalues. And these are just generally used to evaluate their scholar number to describe the different principal components, but they kind of give you an idea of how significant or how much each of those principal components are described in the geochemical variability in your data set. So in this case, PC1 describes about 44% of it. So the bulk of it is just described by that first principal component. And as you'll see, PC2 is a lower number, 50, and that's kind of how it goes. The general rule that is used often in statistics is kind of the cutoff of a value of one. So often what you'll see is people myself included, is when you just take the first three principal components, but as soon as you get past that less than one, you kind of just drop those. Um, there's other more advanced statistical ways to do that, but it is kind of the quick, dirty way so you can keep moving on with your statistics. And usually you can find what you're looking for within those significant greater than one eigenvalues. The next one I was gonna bring attention to is the eigenvector table. And so you'll get this in anything as well. And these are your loadings. So these loadings, kind of give an idea of how correlated these different elements are to your actual principal components. Um, and the ones you're most interested in are the high values. If you're getting to lower values, they're less significant. You can actually run the statistics to see which ones are statistically significant. I didn't really do that here, but I just kind of highlighted the ones with the largest loading just to kind of demonstrate the points here. So in this case, I was kind of going to pay attention to aluminum and silica. And that's because I, I know this data set, I know these rocks, they're from Nova Scotia. And this transition from um, aluminum with negative PC1 to positive um, PC1 is directly related to the clay content as a transition from an argillite to a gray wacky rock. So that's what this is really describing. So you can see that in this data and it's with knowledge of the actual rocks that we interpret that. The second piece of here is going to bring up is what we're probably why we have this data is because we're looking for gold. And so we can see that gold and the pathfinder elements, arsenic, and then there's a sulfur occurring with it. So we have a sulfidation um, associated with an arsenic or pyrite occurring and gold mineralization associated in those rocks as well. And so kind of we can use that PC2 to describe that mineralization of these silicic plastic rocks that we're looking at. Um, and the last table here I was going to bring up is just the principal component coordinates. And this is really the data that we end up working for. So using these eigen um, vectors, we end up calculating or transforming our data. So every interval that we um, analyze ends up having a series table with a number of principal components. This shows PC1 through PC12. Um, really, like according to this table, we're only going to actually be interested in PC1 and the three, because those are the only ones that are really significant. And that's what these are in these tables. But these are the numbers we end up working at, looking at and interpreting, and we can even plot those in space to see how they occur down drill hole traces, or if they're outcrop samples, how they're occurring in the field. I also just wanted to mention at the bottom here that there is other statistics that we can evaluate our principal components. So this isn't the end all, this is the most basic outputs you're just gonna get when you actually run a PCA. But you can also evaluate your PCAs and interpret them 
by looking at the contributions of your actual eigen um, vectors or your, sorry, your principal components weighting onto your individual observations and vice versa. You can look at observations or polling or over um, compensated within your principal components. So there's further statistics you can dwell, um, go into to evaluate this further. Um, so I was going to talk about how we actually apply these results and how we're using them into a gold exploration or mineral exploration example. So to just talk about what kind of data we work with personally here at Mercator and others as well, I imagine, is um, there's different types of geochem that geologists have to deal with. So get, commonly we have rock or prospecting samples from outcrops or even boulders in that matter. Um, we also get soil grids, so we take soil samples. Um, there's different types of that, right? B horizon, C horizon, till samples, um, downhole drill data. So we ask, say, what we're um, collecting from an RC or from a diamond drill rig. Um, and then a last one I'll mention here, and I'm going to include a small example at the end. This is something we're just kind of investigating, um, just kind of on a as a side project here, Mercator is trying to use PCA on tree bark twig survey stuff. So some older data that we've compiled. And so um, there's different types of geochem that you see a lot. If you're ever into compiling data for an exploration project, you'll see that going through old assessment report files, there's a lot of data available. It's just a matter of extracting that data and then actually looking at that data. Um, and something else that really needs to be considered when you're going into one of these is the analytical methods. And it's not so much which methods, though some methods do give you better detection limits and more accurate results, but you don't want to be mixing too many things when you're doing this, because that's what your principal component analysis is going to start pulling out. So um, mixing like aqua regia with four acid digestion, that's going to really bias your principal component. So you really um, want to probably choose which group of data you want to work with. Um, yeah. And then um, you um, want to keep in mind that each of these different methods have variable detection limits, over limits, missing elements. And the key problem that a lot of data sets have is that when we're assaying as geologists, often we do selective sampling. Not many, there's some, but not many databases are actually full top to bottom drill holes. And this is just um, an economic decision. I understand that. And that's kind of the reality of the data we have to deal with. So there's an over bias typically I find within a lot of drill hole databases towards um, mineralized or altered rock. So that's something to keep in mind when you're designing this and especially when you're interpreting things um, spatially because if you're creating an interpolate, it's gonna really bias along there. So you kind of have to make sure you keep that in your back of the mind if there's any kind of just sampling bias that's influencing your results. So I just wanted to bold a couple points just at the end here to emphasize a couple things is that not all analytical methods are equal. So really you have to be careful about mixing different analytical methods. Um, I prefer, I try to keep just one type of data together. Um, not that I've never tried to level or bring data in together, but it's uh, probably better to kind of compare apples to apples. Um, and then the last point I wanted to bring up was that most like real like world exploration multi element data sets are less than ideal. So they're not optimized. Um, so we're dealing with kind of messy data sets most of the time. So there's a lot of filtering and filling in um, missing values, missing intervals, not continuous sampling. So there's a lot of real world problems to deal with. So um, it's something to keep in mind and that we're just trying to pull out trends usually within those data sets. Um, so a little bit about how we approach it here, how we use the uh, PCA method at Mercator. Um, the first thing we do is when we start bringing in the data, so we're given an assay sheet, we start linking it to other data. Like um, nothing is interpreted in isolation. We don't just take the geochemistry and say this is what's going on. We use any information that a geologist would have collected logging drill holes or collected in the field. Um, and we replace things like detection limits and over limits. And, uh, so we kind of clean up the data that we be able to do the PCA and set it up in a way that we'll be able to more easily um, interpret the data. Um, and when we do the PCA, we design it usually for a specific objective. We don't do it really that blind. We usually have, we're usually looking for something in the data. So 
we select the elements to kind of answer a particular question. And then we filter out intervals and weathering samples if we don't want that and various things. And then we run the PCA. And then we evaluate the PCA and then we rerun the PCA. It's usually not just one time, there's the results, we get it. Because we have to evaluate if it's actually showing us what we want and if the results are real. So there's a lot of back and forth. Um, I think on average, it probably half a dozen runs I do until I'm satisfied with it, that those are the results that I'll present to a client. So it's a little bit of a back and forth process. Um, often I find things like lithology is overly biased in the PCA, so I'm not pulling out maybe the alteration signature in one rock type I want. So I said, maybe if I get rid of the quartz vein, then I'll get the results I want. So there's a lot of like questioning what's going on in the data and trying to get it to tell you what you wanted to tell it. So it's not just going to automatically give you the right results. It takes a little bit of legwork and thinking and problem solving, I find, in my experience. And then lastly, once we get a PCA that we like, we can interpret it. And this is using a lot of additional geological information. We usually don't only have geochemical data or from rocks or soil. We have additional information. Areas have been mapped previously. So does the PCA interpretation make sense? in light of other geophysical and um, geological information that's been collected in that area before. So these are just some examples that we've done directly at Mercator um, over the time that we've been doing this. Uh, I imagine others have other examples and other questions that they want to answer, but these are just some of the main ones that we've dealt with previously. Um, so first, we just modeling gold mineralization. So for to interpolate a target, for infill drilling or for to extend in a deposit um, by the PCA is great at combining the gold mineralization with the pathfinder elements in a single PC. So it kind of provide the more smooth interpolant that can be used for targeting. Um, also one that I've kind of come across is uh, doing a geochemical signature of the stratigraphic unit. So if you can geochemically fingerprint the different strata units within a sequence of rocks in a deposit area, in exploration, you can actually kind of stratigraphically define where you are within those um, in, as you're stepping out further. So it's a way, it's a great combination with the uh, Kings clustering, I find with that. Once you have that definition, you can search for it in future holes and interpret your geology below the surface. Um, mapping quartz veins, so um, looking at their geochemistry, I'll have an example of this shortly. Um, and then to generate new targets. So kind of those prospectivity maps, um, creating prospectivity maps and defining a geochemical signature associated with the deposit. And you're looking for that either in soil or rock samples and finding where those areas are so you can create new targets for exploration. Um, the last one is probably the most common one that it gets brought before me and asked for is a lot of people are looking for that hydrothermal alteration signature that's associated with the deposit. And this is kind of twofold. One, to either just do regional exploration in the area to find rocks with similar alteration, or to actually extend the deposit, kind of like I was saying up top when you're up, kind of extend your deposit. Um, yeah, so that's probably the most common that I have I've approached is looking for that alteration signature. Um, so as I say, it's kind of to an example, and this is part of a much larger project that we've done, but it's just a small piece of it, but it demonstrates the um, that specific question asked that you guys talking about. So in this part of the um, project, we were looking at if there was any geochemical variation of the different veins that were going there. So we knew veins were going in different orientations and that there was gold associated with some and not others. And we wanted to know if there's a geochemical signature associated with that um, gold, um, the gold concentrations. So this is just the, the results here. So this is just PC1 versus PC1. It should be PC2. I'm sorry, I just caught that error. Um, it's actually PC1 versus PC2. And it shows the, the results of the cluster analysis. Um, so four main clusters here in the data. This is just strictly defined based on the geochemistry, a principal component plus a Kings cluster. And if we took these clusters and kind of plotted them on the stereo net, um, there's a little less um, numbers over here, so I kind of just lump things together just by drawing polygons on them. We find that certain compositions are occurring in certain orientations, which is important because actually that cluster number one here, and I know this because this actually gold's increasing in this direction, PC1, 
is that that PC1 is the one that we're actually looking for as a target, which has a kind of more specific orientation within the deposit. So it kind of helps answer the question of which quartz veins we should be chasing versus which ones we should not be chasing in there. So I'm gonna move on now to talking about working actually with these results. And that's the main question is how do you, you run the PCA and IOGAS or whatever software you like to work. So this is the same table from a few slides ago, and this is what you get. And then it's kind of like, now what? What do we want to do next with this data? How are we going to use this to help find a goal target or whatever we're trying to do with the data? So I've kind of hinted at it a little bit before, and these are the bottom here, these one and two are the two kind of approaches that I've taken. There might be other ways, but um, these are the ways that I kind of choose between. So sometimes you're just doing a cluster analysis, such as that k-means cluster. So that just kind of lumps your data together, and then you can kind of map that out and look for what you want in that data. So it might just be able to look for um, a geochemical signature that's got a, um, that is associated with the gold deposit that you want to look for. You want to find where other samples like that exist. The other one is, is uh, just actually plotting these different PCs, these raw numbers that are created from the PCA out in real 2D or 3D time. And so you can actually like grid these or interpolate them, um, interpolants and leapfrog or whatever software you want to work with. And you can define where they are. And if you're interpreting them to represent certain geological processes, in a way they're kind of mapping those, that, out, that process out for you in real space. So the next example I have here is the soil grid example. Um, so I'm just going to show, I have three different gridded images in the next three slides. They're kind of comparing if you just took gold um, and then a path fire element arsenic and then took the PC1 result. And kind of comparing what the actual gridding of these are. I know that there's a lot of controversy if you should grid gold results or not or um, soil survey grids. But I, for demonstration purposes, I kind of just try to give them the same treatment from the same way. So um, in this case, if we were just looking for gold anomalism, um, so this is a 100 by 50 meter B horizon so soil survey grid in a property that's next door to a mine. So there's just a mine just up this road actually up here. And there's been gold showing up in this area. So they're trying to find if this trend of gold anomalism continues downtrend on, along this anticline. So the anticline is strongly associated with gold deposits here in Nova Scotia. So that's what we're kind of chasing is that. And we're trying to find out where the anomalous gold is work occurring, but we're looking at other elements as well. So we collected both gold and multi-element geochemistry. Um, the, the actual anticline and faults are uh, from a combined uh, map, field mapping and from geophysics. So these are defined from other sources, uh, predominantly not these actual geochemical data. But what we find with the gold towards the mine area, we do get a lot more gold in that area. But we also do have some clusters over here, but they're not defining any trends. They're just kind of giving us blotchy areas that show it. Oh, there's something going on here, maybe. What is it? We don't know. Um, the next option is to look at just looking at a pathfinder element. And this actually isn't that bad. When I produce this, it really does pull out that anticline. And it's probably the glaciers that are smearing it along that anticline going this way. It gives a very um, broad envelope going kind of to the self from the anticline. But I like the principal component, and that's what this is. This is the PC1. So this actually kind of combines the gold and the arsenic and the pathfinders into a single principal component. This time it is PC1. And it also kind of maps out that same anticline, but it gives a little more definition. So it doesn't smear as far. So we can actually follow where that anticline is actually going. Um, and I really like how it was able to pull out that fault that is well, uh, mapped out here. And in a way, this one as well. So we can see that the chemistry actually changes along these orientations. So it's actually pulling out that definition that you can get um, of the structural orientations in this area. So I think that's pretty compelling and we can confidently map out with that anticline and probably create some targets using some of the other layers of principal components within here. Um, oh, and then, sorry, I went too far in the mouse. So the last slide I wanted to bring in here, and this is a kind of a kind of an important disclaimer, is none of these principal components, and I've said it before, are analyzed 
are interpreted in isolation. These are the same PCs. This one is that PC one that we just looked at, but there's other principal components that were considered significant and giving us valid information. But we look at all these layers together, the geophysics and the geochemical results, along with things like LIDAR, um, field mapping, or uh, existing geological maps. Um, those are all put together to kind of help that interpretation of what is um, affecting the uh, geochemistry that we're interpreting. So everything's looked in context of additional geological information. Um, so I'm now going to go through a case study. So once again, this is a Nova Scotia, um, Canada gold deposit. Um, it's an orogenic gold deposit that's in Nova Scotia, and it was mined. So this is a previously mined deposit. It was mined up to the 1940s, discovered in the mid 1800s. Um, like most deposits that exist in Nova Scotia, it's gold is hosted in bed and parallel quartz veins that occur within the uh, we call the Maguma terrain, which is made up of these uh, gray, wacky to argillite siliciclastic rocks um, that occur. The gold deposits are almost always in these anticlines. There's a few anomalies to that, like in the syncline, but they occur in these tightly folded ant plunging anticlines. In this case, the anticlines plunge into the east. And that's, I'm just stating that because in the uh, long sections that have become evident. Um, the actual drilling program wasn't looking for we already knew it was there. So there, we knew that there was already gold bearing quartz veins, but they wanted, our client wanted to test if the Silica classic rocks themselves were also mineralized. So kind of looking more for a low grade gold deposit model, as opposed to a high grade vein system, something that's more economical to mine. So the objective with taking the PCA or the multi alma data was to kind of look to see if we can see that hydrothermal alteration associated with the gold. Um, so this is kind of a pre-mining plan. So it's a, it's a long section through the um, old mine working. So that's what these gray pipes are here. That's the actual shaft that exists there. You can go there on the surface and actually see the old shafts at the surface. Um, the quartz veins are in pink here. Those are the leads that were mined along these shafts. And then these drill hole transects are the uh, what was drilled in the drilling program. So we intersect a lot of these uh, leads. And um, so, we're looking for the gold in there, but we're really trying to test those rocks in between those leads is what the objective was, to see if they were mineralized themselves. So just a few words on the exploration methods that were used. It was a reverse circulation drilling program um, in the area of the old mine workings. Um, samples were taken on a one meter sample basis. So just pretty much every sample size was the same, one meter. Um, they were both chip logged and analyzed from multi element. The chip log, there was a, Fuel process where we were sieving out a, chip, a coarse chip sample to be logged in our database. So we recorded things like lithology, um, presence of quartz veins, or um, different minerals if sulfidization was occurring or whatnot. And uh, then we were also taking the fine fractions. So when we were getting the coarse, we were collecting the fines underneath. And from those fines, we would create a little um, XRF puck, I guess you can call it and the uh, fine fraction was analyzed by a portable XRF. So we were collecting multi-element data using a portable XRF. And then we did our, the gold assays that were just using standard 30 gram fire assays um, on a one meter basis. So we had multi-element data, plus we had gold assay data combined. Um, and so we used that multi-element combined the gold to run kind of a combined um, PCA on the, and this results in like three significant principal components. Um, and just kind of a, to understand that early example I showed is based on this data here, that one that was earlier in the uh, presentation. Um, and so I'm just gonna walk through the interpretation of those three different principal components. So the first one jumps out in this case as being directly correlated with um, gold mineralization along with the pathfinder arsenic here. There's other pathfinders that come up in there as well, but you can see just if you take the raw PC number that it's pretty correlated with both of these elements. So it's a pretty good description of when you have an increase in both of these elements. Um, in principle component two, it is interpreted to be related to the clay content within the rock. So as we're transitioning from gray wacky to argillite. So these are the color codes here are actually the log lithology. These are not like a K-means cluster or anything like that. 
This is what the geologist logged it as the primary pathology that they saw. So whatever the dominant chip was within the field. And so generally the gray wackies have negative PC2 values, whereas the argillite have more positive. So in a way you can use this to interpret that transition within the sequence of rocks. And the third principal component, and this is included also quartz veins. So the red dots here are ones that were 100% quartz. So there was no siliciclastic rocks in the chip sample. So these are just the pure quartz samples. And they tend to have that positive PC3 value. And so that becomes our interpretation that that represents the quartz veins in them. And um, yeah, so we can use that kind of as a, I like to call it the uh, quartz vein finder, the quartz vein indicator. And so we can use this data to actually form a geological model of our deposit um, or our exploration target, I should say. Um, and so in this case, I actually use the K-means as demonstration here. So we can use that PC2 that was associated with the lithology to kind of map out those beds. And so it's not very evident from RC chips. You don't have any structural information. There's a hole. So a lot of this knowledge of the actual orientation of the rocks comes from additional information, just knowledge based on um, underground mapping and above ground mapping. So we use that in conjunction with our lithologies to kind of map out where these anticlines are actually occurring and where these beds are being folded within it. Um, and then at that PC3, so we can use that to actually verify the location of those leads. So those leads were actually initially um, drawn and leapfrogged using old mine plans. So they were mapped out from old mine plans, underground mine plans. And, uh, and so they, we don't know the accuracy of that data. So we could actually use that PC3 to kind of coincide with those to see if we need to tweak it a couple meters this way or a couple meters that way. So it's a good indicator of showing us where those quartz leads are occurring. So these ones are actually, these disks are just showing the absolute highest, I think 20% values of PC3 to kind of indicate where there's a high quartz concentration. Um, and so the last part is actually modeling out that hydrothermal alteration and gold dissemination. So I reran the PCA. So like I was talking about where I run a PCA and then I rerun a PCA, this is actually an example that I did that. Um, since we weren't interested in finding those quartz veins again, because we already knew they were there, we already know they have gold, we really are looking for the gold that is hosting within the argillite and gray wackies. So we did a filter on the data set afterwards. I uh, got rid of anything that had greater than 5% log uh, logged quartz. There was a little bit of quartz maybe in there, but um, and then I ran the PCA. The results were very similar, minus the PC3 mapping out quartz veins. So we used that to actually map out with this altered or um, low-grade gold mineralization from um, silicic plastic rocks is occurring. So again, those same trends are present, the uh, gold and the arsenic are both correlated again with PC1. And so to kind of give the full story here, this is uh, again, looking at our mine area. So the mine is focused in this area here, um, looking for mining these folded leads here. And so these disks this time, are um, indicating our, some of our higher gold intercepts. So anything greater than one gram per ton over one meter, we call it these were one meter RC samples um, and where they occur. So generally we find that these higher gold rates are coinciding with our quartz leads that, we were, um, that were previously mined. We get a few others outside there. So some maybe additional leads occurring away from there. Um, but if we now bring in our principal component in, um, our principal component data, so we did an interpolant on that PC1 that defines the um, mineralized or hydrothermally altered gray wacky and argillite, we can look how that spatially correlates with these high, uh, the high gold grades. So again, the high gold grades are with these leads, but we see the host rocks that are adjacent to them, there seems to be a very localized alteration in here. So it doesn't seem to be continuous going through these areas that are in between the leads. So they're not very mineralized or altered between the different leads. But what we found though, is these more Eastern holes that are moving away from the previously mined area, we started seeing this big envelope of kind of like a gold halo or um, with an increase of arsenic and sulfur being associated with it. And that kind of becomes our defined low grade gold mineralization. We're talking low grade, we're talking 
maybe like sub like about 0 0.1. So we're not quite at like economic grade, but we are at a point where it gives us a further exploration target. So we're hoping to step out and see that. And this is just another view of that. So we're looking at the long section again, and this time it emphasizes again that we have very localized alteration in disseminated goals adjacent to those leads with the high grade goals. But as we go more east, we see that the envelopes kind of increase in this direction. So this is the target that we're looking at drilling in the near future. So um, it's kind of an exciting application of this, uh, the PC method, and I think a fairly successful one. Um, so I have a few small examples here. Some of them are from bigger projects, but I just wanted to kind of bring up a few scenarios and for more demonstration that um, there's a little bit more we can do with this than, than I just showed. So that example I just showed was a very lithologically simple um, example. It just had basically argillite and gray wacky with quartz veins. So when you put all that data into a PC, it's fairly smooth and clean. That's not the case most of the times. Um, geology is a lot more complicated than that. So this is this more uh, complex example I just wanted to bring up was uh, one I did fairly recently. It's an agoma type BIF hosted deposit within our Cane Greenstone Belt. And there's a high mineral variability between the main lithologies there. So we have igneous sills in the sequence, we have siliciclastics, and we also have the BIF unit. So geochemically, these are very like like they vary a lot between them, obviously. Um, and so that variability that we get associated with it, these different lithology ends up dominating your PCA. So it's really hard to pull out any kind of easy trend that you can use as a vector to find where your mineralization or alteration is occurring. Um, so this is kind of, if you did that, and I did do that, is just put all the data in there. These are the um, seven, not all the lithology, but these are the seven most dominant ones there. And you can see that they really are controlling the principal, especially the dominant principal components here. Um, and that you can probably use it to classify the type of rocks, and maybe a K means would do that for this. But it's really hard to look for, if you're looking for an alteration trend within, say, the BIF units, it's really hard to find it in here when the actual PC1 and everything's being defined by so many different mythologies. And so the solution we've kind of evolved into here at Mercator is we do kind of a parsing PCA kind of technique. So we would take our major lithologies and create sub data sets of each of those main lithologies and run separate PCAs on them. And then we try to integrate them at the end. So we kind of make a common scale because um, the raw scales aren't always equal. So you can't really just do this. You have to level them or rescale them in some kind of fashion. And we try to integrate them back to see if we can find the same trends within different rock types. But rocks do alter differently because they're different host. The, the protoliths are so different that they do alter differently. So the trends aren't always apparently the same in the different mythologies. But um, it's a way to integrate the data and look at something that's very mythologically variable within a deposit. The other one I wanted to bring up is that sometimes your PCA doesn't work out as clean as you want it to work out. Um, and this is just the kind of an example. So, the ideal case is that your loadings on your principal components are kind of arranged in a way that they're really like gold is dominated on one or potassium is on another. And it makes it very clear to say, okay, gold mineralization is associated with PC1, potassium is associated with PC2. But what often happens is, is that you actually get equal loadings between different principal components. So this is an example, say you're looking for potassium alteration, which is associated with rubidium and barium as well. And it's kind of almost equally weighted on PC3 and PC5, which means which one do you use to actually search for that vector of elements in there? And so there is solutions to that, and there's um, different kind of factor analysis rotation algorithms. Um, this is going beyond what you can do in IOGAS, to my knowledge anyways. Um, so I've done it more in R myself. Um, I've also done it in Excel. <laughs> um, in a different kind of technique, but the ones that are nice because they're easy and clean and they kind of optimize your um, principal components. So it tries to redistribute the loadings so that a group of elements is distributed along fewer PCs. So if we use that PC5, the previous, there's a very low correlation um, between potassium and PC5. But once we did the rotation to it, you can see that PC5 becomes pretty definite for your um, potassium. 
um, concentration in there. You can use it to describe it. Um, so the last example I wanted to just talk about was uh, that biochemistry. And I put the word preliminary there because this is just something I've been playing with. I only did this, I think, last week or the week before, but I had a little bit of downtime. Um, and it's something we've been talking about because in Nova Scotia, it was kind of a common um, exploration technique back in about the 90s was there was a lot of a um, balsam fir or spruce bark surveys going on. And so that data is readily available, just kind of sitting there in assessment reports. So the idea is, can we go back and acquire something that wasn't acquired before from that data set? So I kind of got a little bit of a start on this. And this is a very large grid. There was three of them done by Roger and done through Nova Scotia. And um, this one's over the eastern Nova Scotia. I selected this one because that's where the most of the gold deposits are. But it's a very low sample density. So you know, kind of have to take up the grain salt, like uh, grain of salt um, in interpreting this data and how um, relevant it really is. Um, so just to say about the method, it's a multi-element ICP package done on ASH samples. And the PCA results kind of indicated, it found that PC4 was more correlated with that gold and arsenic. So no secret there. Now you guys all know that when you're looking for gold in Nova Scotia, you're looking for arsenic, but uh, same case here within the trees. Um, and so this is the gridded results. So similarly to what I did for that soil grid early. And there is a, there's a pretty good correlation, I think, between the positive PC4 and the location of these gold deposits in there. Um, there's a little bit of anomalism that has to be explained, like up in the north. But I just so happen to know there's a big mythology contact that goes through here as well. So it kind of has to come into the interpretation here that this rock type here that's much younger than the ones down here probably has to be interpreted differently or possibly parsed out of this initial PC that I did. Um, and I think I'm coming to the final thoughts I have on this. So just some final considerations and my, uh, my philosophy, I guess, on principle component analysis. So I do find, in my experience, that it's a pretty effective method to explore full multi-elements. So you're getting a lot more in your data set instead of just selecting the gold and the few pathfinder elements. And plus, you can sometimes find pathfinders a lot quicker that you may have not thought of before within your data set using PCA. So it's, uh, it's an effective tool, yes. And then um, there's a lot of ongoing research and debate. I've seen a few of this, and I've been my wrist slapped a couple times, um, but there's ongoing research about what the best method is to deal with things like less than detection limits, over limits, data gaps, spatial interpolations. And these are big questions that we need to kind of have ways. And I think people have different opinions. Um, for instance, for lower than LODs and over limits, my personal preference methods, I just don't use things that have too many less than detections. I don't think it gives you relevant results. So I kind of drop it and I don't like to overly process and interpolate my data. So I like things to be as raw as possible. So usually I end up dropping them, but I know there is ways to kind of do a regression to fill in those gaps, which are well-refined methods that I know of. Um, and then the last thing I want to bring up is that this is not the end all for geochemical modeling. I am perfectly aware and uh, I know there's other methods that people have out there and are developing. And, it's just one method. And that's something I'm really interested in. And like we're looking at Mercator is kind of investigating some of these methods. And I'm really interested in doing comparative studies. So comparing what kind of results you get from one method versus the other and kind of evaluating which ones is giving a more true result. So it's something that I further in reading on and developing in-house here. So I think that takes me to the end of the presentation. Um, and that's my contact info. So if you have any questions for me, feel free to email me um, and check out our website and follow us on LinkedIn. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was really interesting. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I, well, I really, um, I really like how you highlighted that uh, this is actually just like one tool in the whole toolbox of like geochemical data sets. And it's not meant to be like a one shot magic, <laughs> magic thing. It really is something that you, you work all together. We already have a couple, and so while people, while people gather their their thoughts and ask questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna start you off with a really basic one. Um, so it seems like uh, I'm assuming that the larger data sets that you work with, the more robust the um, information that you can glean from it. Is there a minimum to how many, uh, like how small of a data set is your minimum that would be actually effective? Um, 
I would not go lower than hundreds. I think ideally you want at least maybe a thousand. Is kind of, that's really a ballpark number. I wouldn't go lower than hundreds. So when I talked about parsing by mythology and those major mythologies, if I'm breaking them out, I'm not going to do any of the mythologies that have less than 100 intervals usually because the results become a little more harder to interpret. I think. So you do need a good amount of data, I think, to actually pull up meaning. Okay, um, we've got a few questions coming up in the chat. So um, I'm going to come to you if you would like to ask your question out loud and you can unmute yourself. Um, so uh, Gilhelme Ferreira, I'm um, sorry if I pronounced it wrong, but um, if you would like to unmute yourself, you could ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, I sort of follow up with Ren's question. Uh, I wonder what is the minimum number of um, samples and assays that do you think would be uh, significant to apply this method. For example, usually uh, we have uh, samples that are assayed for uh, multi-element like SCP-30 element determination. If you have <clears throat> uh, basic you know, geochemical samples with soil samples, uh, it'd be okay. But if usually companies, when they sample uh, the, uh, the drill hole, they usually uh, assay for only a few number of elements, uh, gold, silver, lead, copper, zinc, and a few more. What is your recommendation? How many assays should you, you, you need to be able to significantly uh, determine the, the effect of each component? Um, it depends on your objective. So if, what it sounds like your example is, is that you're assaying for both gold plus you're kind of your um, pathfinder. So you're looking to see what those pathfinders are showing as well. I think you could you could run it even with a handful of elements. So you could run it with six. Um, I guess the end value that I thought like Ren was asking, I like to have the bigger the database, the better. But I usually look for things in the hundreds. I find um, usually when I do it though, the data sets usually have those greater than thirty. But I've used as little as like fifteen or sixteen elements usually is the lowest I've used. But I, there's no reason the statistics won't work on a smaller data set that only has gold plus five or six pathfinders. And that might be not a bad way to determine which ones are actually correlated with gold. So it could give you an idea of which pathfinder you should really want to use on. So I think you still get meaning out of the data. It's just um, how far you want to take that, I guess. Thank you. OK, great. Um, I'll now come to the question that was coming up before um, from Guilherme Ferreira. So uh, uh, technically, we've, uh, we are working with uh, some not normal data uh, that the mean uh, does not represent the, the, the better uh, measure to represent the center of data. Uh, uh, most of people uh, log transform data uh, so then they can uh, work with, uh, with uh, PCA, but uh, there are some people that do, that do not do this transformation, this uh, log transformation, and runs PCA, uh, uh, this, uh, runs PCA, uh, uh, so uh, what would be the problem with uh, apply uh, PCA on non-parametric data, non-normal uh, data? Uh, can you get my, my question? I think so, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, all data I have presented here, I think every example had a um, center log um, ratio transformation on it. Um, yeah, so you're not, you're going to get really spurious correlations if you didn't do any transformation on your data set. You're, you're going to pull up trends that are just, well, not real. Um, and you're, in fact, when you start looking at the plots, you're, they usually look pretty funky when you do that. Um, and they're hard to interpret, I find. There's different, I, early stuff I've done was um, just using kind of a base log 10 transformation on the data, which I know is not the ideal. And I know that that's, I had my wrist slap for that one. But um, it's, uh, it still wasn't bad. The results were not terrible from that. So you do need to transform and normalize your data as best as you can because you're definitely going to pull skewing in your data as far from my experience doing it. 
Okay, but thank I, you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Um, we have a, a question from Tanisha Schultz, and she'd like to know, is it useful to use PCA for calculated mineral sites to understand the relationship between the substitution between the different mineral sites? Uh, is it substitution like actual the mineral chemistry? I would say yes. If you had a data set made up of mineral chemistry, like you acquired from like um, a microprobe or any kind of source of data, yes, I would think it would work fairly well on that. I think it would. So that's basically what I'm doing, but I'm looking at um, micas. So I'm just curious to know if I can use a PCA um, just to work out relationships um, between the, the sites in the, in the micas. I would, I've never done it with micas or with mineral chemistry in general. It, um, what we're doing here is usually with whole raw geochemistry. Mm. Um, but in my thoughts, I don't see why not. I've worked with the mineral chemistry a lot before. I used to study chromites, but um, yeah, they, uh, I, I would see it working. I don't see why it wouldn't work. I, I think it would be actually a good application method for it. Oh, my thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, Tanisha and Ryan. Um, we've got another question here. Um, Herman Grutter, if you'd like to, I think you're unusual already, if you'd like to ask it. Uh, hi, Ryan. Yeah, you can see these questions if you open up the chat panel on the right hand side. Right. And you, it's easier for you to follow along. But basically, I think you've answered my question which was, do you, do you routinely run your PCA on log transforms ratios? And your answer was yes. yes. And you initially, you initially did a, a log 10 transform and obviously you're now doing log two transforms, things like that. The question I had is, have you, have you ever compared a, a outcomes on not using log transform data? In fact, just using plain uh, raw analytical data. I would, I haven't recently, I think um, maybe I, I did that a couple of years ago, I would recall. Um, so yes, and if I remember correctly, when I'm looking at the untransformed data, it's a very odd looking, like you get a lot of odd vectors pulling in weird directions, if I recall. Um, so I'm just going on a kind of an extended memory here right now, but I, I, I have looked at it before, yes. But it's uh, not something I've done um, recently, I should say. Okay, can I just quickly chip in with a follow-up? I mean, do you consider trace elements part of a closed system, or do you believe that they are actually free and 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 in part of an open system? They would be part of a closed system in my mind. Okay, I mean that's interesting because metasomatism and mineralization is 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 basically metasomatic. And it's fluid exchange. So you're actually changing the rock composition. Um, and mineralization principles would be open system. It's open system fluid flow. So I'll just leave that one with you, just a comment. Okay, thank you. And we've got a, a couple more questions. Ryan, you still good for another five minutes? Yeah, maybe or so? one or two more. Yeah. Okay. Go. Great. Um, Rin, do you, do you have the next one there? I do, yes. Um, we have a question from Claudio Gonzalez Solis, and uh, if they'd like to unmute themselves and ask a question. Okay. Hello, Ryan. Good talk. I saw in a, that sometimes you can use the script plot from IOGAS to discriminate uh, which uh, principal components you want to to use. Is this is a, a valid technique? Or what do you think? Using the graphs that are produced in IOGAS to determine which principal components you wish to use? Yep. I don't, I think that's okay. Um, there, you can do that. Like I said early in the presentation, my preference is I like to look at the numbers, but I have looked at those graphs and I've used those graphs to demonstrate what I am looking for. So yeah, I think they're fine to look at and to use. Um, you may want to be careful just to make sure that if you use only one of those graphs, you may find, like I said, that sometimes it's correlated with other principal components that are not in that graph. So you may have to make sure you check all of them. If you um, are only looking at two principal components, you may realize that there's another one that actually defines that element even more than those.
those ones. Okay, just trying to be sure we are not missing data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Claudio. Okay, um, we've got another one for um, the host to read out from Mike McCormick. Um, so Ryan, you mentioned in your primary example, the use and combo of PXRF and gold SAG chemical data for eventual PCA. Did you initially combine those data sets? And if so, how or use PCA individually and integrate them later for an uh, end interpretation conclusions? I uh, combined them prior to running the PCA. They were combined and then integrated. But I've ran a PCA without the gold results and they give very similar trends. So you could get away without including the gold, but since we were looking for gold, we decided to use the version with the gold in it. Okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks, it's interesting um, to see those differences, similarities. Sorry, Rin. <laughs> oh yeah, that's all right. I was just gonna. I think. Um, I think maybe the the last question is uh, from Yoram, and uh, they'd like to know how would you apply PCA to compositional data and non-compositional data? An example: gamma or density together. Um. I haven't done that, and I don't know if that's a great idea at this point. So my expertise on doing that, um, my expertise, I, I can't say. I, I don't know, but it's something I have thought about. So once you give a solution, Yoram, come tell me so I can do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, okay? it seems like that's all we have time for. Um, thank you, everyone who asked questions. And uh, we are sorry if we weren't able to get to yours. Uh, Brian, you've had quite a few comments on how great the talk was and how clear and um, uh, really good examples to use um, to demonstrate this process. Um, yeah, so we'd like to thank everyone for attending. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Looks like I got a very good response. So I'm happy to be here. All right. Thanks.